Radio is a radio. Hi, this is Michael Roach, and you're with us. Uh, I'm your host for the Conversation with the Blues, a podcast sponsored by the European Blues Association, incorporating the archive of African American music. We're here to talk about the blues, but we're also here to let you know that the Paul Oliver Collection is fully digitized, cataloged, and housed over at Oxford Brooks University. And our guest to talk about his experience in the blues is Axel Kusner from Germany. Welcome, Axel. Thanks for the invitation, Michael. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I had a great time last night meeting a lot of old friends like you, Lightning Welts from North Carolina, Adam Franklin, and his charming daughter for meeting her for the first time. My old buddy, Dave Peabody is right here in the studio yeah. with us, Dave snapping is, pictures. That's right, Dave is here with us. I, so I thought that maybe we should have Dave in it, but I'm thinking we're going to hold Dave for another conversation for another time. He's one of the veterans of the British blues scene. That's right. So he's got a lot of stories to tell. Oh yeah. I'm sorry to say that I'm not an active musician, except blowing the harmonica a little bit, but Dave's been at it for a long time, played with a lot of great musicians, so he's got a lot of stuff to... to uh, tell the audience. Hey, but you got something in common with as a musician with Bob Dylan, um, Charlie Muscle, White, Charlie Paul Muscle Butterfield, White, Paul Butterfield, and uh, Sonny Boy, John Lee, Sonny Boy the first. So, what is that you have in common with them? Uh, it sounds strange, but we all uh, played harmonica, backing up the blues giant, Big Joe Williams. <laughs> <laughs> most people, most rock fans, don't even know that Bob Dylan. Uh, played uh, harmonica on a couple of tracks in 1963 or 62 in New York City for Spivy Records. Wow. Well, I'd like to talk about that because let me sneak this in. Paul's conversation with the blues. And uh, have you ever met Paul? I met him briefly one time when I was in Memphis in 1980. I think uh, there was a, there was a festival going. And uh, David Evans, uh, uh, the musicologist from Memphis, uh, he invited a few people from uh, Europe over. So I met Paul Oliver very briefly and uh, also uh, Bruce Bastin. And what happened, uh, I knew of the festival and I was staying in Mississippi uh, with Big Joe Williams. And we decided to drive up to Memphis. That was in July, 1980. Uh, there might be an off chance that David Evans would put uh, Big Joe on the show, on the festival, but he didn't. So we were <laughs> hanging out in the lobby of the hall where the, the uh, concert was happening, and Paul Oliver happened to be there and had a, had a uh, quick conversation with Big Joe. And uh, I had a quick conversation with, uh, with uh, Bruce Bastin, and I remember Gail Dean Wardlow, the famous researcher, was there as well. Mm -hmm. And he asked me a few questions that he wanted to know, which was kind of strange. The one question he had, uh, he had interviewed the pre-war blues recording artist Johnny Temple okay. in the 60s. Yep. And Johnny Temple claimed that during the war he lived in Berlin. And Gildin Wardlow asked me whether it was possible for an African-American to live in Berlin in Germany during World War II. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> he asked me about it. It was very strange in a way, you know. I've, I've always said to people that, you know, when they talk about black history, black subject matter, blues, for example, they always started with slavery. I keep reminding people that it was always black people in Europe. There was always black people throughout. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a, yeah. there's a great book. Uh, 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 what's the title? Destined to Witness, Hans Masakmoy. Have you read it? No. Uh, he was from a mixed relationship. His father was African, his mother was a, a German nurse. He was born like in 1920 uh, of a mixed relationship. And he grew up in Nazi times as a black child in Hamburg, Germany. That was a very famous book in the 1990s when it came out. Okay. Destined to witness. We're going to find that and we're going to put that on the podcast. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. And yeah. actually, as a, you might, might not believe it, but sometimes, you know, things can get really absurd. He wanted to join the Hitler Youth as a black child. Okay. And then, of course, they wouldn't let him. You know? <laughs> it, it, it's an amazing story. And he wound up uh, 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 in the 50s uh, living in the United States and he, he became the second editor of Ebony magazine. The second editor of Epony. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really interesting. Well, let me let me start with this. In 1989, there was a conference at the University of North Carolina, and Paul uh, 
No, 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 no. This was published by Uni Duke University Press. So let me let make sure I get this corrected. Yes, it was held at Chapel Hill, North Carolina, okay. April 6th to 8th, 1989, to celebrate the opening of the Southern Folklife Collection with the John Edwards Memorial Collection in the Manuscripts Department of the Academic Affairs Library, University of North Carolina. Paul was there. This is the... Uh, uh, I have to admit, I have the book I bought it in the States years ago, but I never read it. So you know what? Okay, all right. So Paul, I have a, uh, uh, a paper that he uh, got published here. It's called Overseas Blues, Europeans and the Blues. Now, let me just start with this chapter here. It says, I must admit that I had been collecting blues for about 10 years before I even heard a record by Robert Johnson. Even longer before I heard one by Charlie Patton. See, that was because a lot of the guys, they were uh, jazz enthusiasts. So right, they were into the piano players before the guitar players. Right, and uh, and I might add that at that time when Paul Oliver got it, hardly any of these old blues recordings had been reissued. Yeah, okay. You know, so yeah. they were hard to find unless it were a few, uh, very few collectors who would would uh, have those records. You know, that was it. So it goes on. It says finding out about the music at all wasn't easy in England during and after World War Two. And yet the curious thing is that much of the research and writing on blues has emanated from Europe. How was it that enthusiasts who shared neither country, color, nor culture with black Americans who created a unique folk music thousands of miles away from them were able to contribute substantially to knowledge and understanding of the idiom? And that's what I'd like to ask you. He was like, I cannot pretend to answer the question, but completely I must hope that somehow it will be understood that there has been a contribution and to what extent the contribution of Europeans has been to the study of blues is something that he endeavored upon all of his life. Right. And so have you. Yeah, to a certain what is degree. It about that? But what is it about that? What is it? What is it so special about the Europeans and their interest in the in, in, in this black art form? Well, you have to understand, Paul had an advantage. There was no language barrier for him, and I'm I'm a full-blooded German. So, in order to be able to understand and read books about it, and liner notes of records and being able to commu communicate with the artists, the blues artists, the American blues artists who would tour Germany, I would have to have a certain degree of education. So okay. I went to high school and started at 10, 10 years old and started learning English in school, you know. So I read American books. Before I got into the blues, I was interested in American Civil War. So uh, I had a few books uh, about the American Civil War. There was only one book available in, in German on the Civil War, and so was uh, uh, books on blues, you know, there was hardly anything available in German. So I would have to be able to get deeper into it and understand it to being able to uh, speak English quite well, you know. That's a good point. A lot of people don't talk about that. But yeah, what? and usually, usually uh, even German blues musicians that are friends of mine, they all have a certain middle class background because they're all fairly well educated. Ah, See, that's a very that's interesting so point, you know, because yeah. they had to be able to yes. to speak English. Yeah. And and at that time, uh, not everybody who was in, in grammar school uh, had the chance to even, even learn English, you know. You only had the chance to do that when you were in high school at that time when I was going that's to school. That's a very good point. That's very good. That's something I never thought of to just now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How so, about recordings then? You talk about the books that you read in English. The, the, what music was you listening to growing up? Well, I remember... Uh, um, how, about I your first, how about your first blues or black music records that you listened to? Yeah, let, let me let me go back to my own history a little bit. Okay. So I started listening to the, to the radio hit parade uh, in 1966. I remember uh, the first song I was pretty impressed with. It was the Beatles, We Can Work It Out, you know. Okay. And then two years later, what happened... Uh, on the hit parade were the old rock and roll uh, tunes, uh, Rock Around the Clock by Bill Haley, Hound Dog by Elvis Presley and stuff like that. And that was a, in 1968, was the first rock and roll revival. So, uh, uh, and I had got a tape machine for my birthday, so I was recording uh, and taping stuff uh, off the radio. And um, so at that time, all the pop music I was listening to, uh, rock bands like the Rolling Stones, 
uh, Jimi Hendrix, Cream, The Doors, uh, Kenneth Heat. All the rock music was basically blues based. They all came came from the blues. So automatically, at one point, uh, you you were confronted with the real blues. You know. So actually, I remember the first time I saw a, a blues, a real blues show. It was on TV. There was a German TV program in 1968 called Swing In, and they had the American Folk Blues Festival on on TV, uh, the show uh, on TV that afternoon. It was Jimmy Reed, Eddie Taylor, uh, Walter Horton, uh, John Lee Hooker, Curtis Jones, and an old, and I, I taped the show with my tape recorder in, from the TV just to get the sound. And and I saw this, this you know, heavy set old man with a weird looking guitar playing some wild stuff on his guitar. And I couldn't believe it. I mean, all the rock musicians were young long-haired guys, you know. Yeah. There was his old man and producing these weird sounds I'd never heard before. And uh, so I was really impressed uh, with that performance, but I didn't pay it much attention. Who was really. it? Who was it? It was Big Joe Williams. Big Joe Williams. How would I know that 10 years later, I would be in his hometown and, and record him and live with him, you know? It's it's so strange when I think think about all these little little parts of my own history. But anyway, one year later, um, during the summer of 1969, there was a blues um, album, a promo blues album came out with some Howling Wolf and some Muddy Waters off of those uh, infamous uh, psychedelic albums uh, mixed with Jimi Hendrix and uh, and uh, I think uh, Rory Gallagher was Taste and Buddy Guy maybe. Uh, that was sold for 10, 10 D marks at that time, really cheap and pressed on as an extra attraction as a, on a white vinyl, you know. So I bought that. That was actually my first blues record and all these names were of course totally unknown to me howling wolf money waters you know what is this all about you know and a couple of months later the same year um uh, columbia records put out a two lp uh, promo set called the blues uh one album uh was um uh, recording from the british blue horizon album uh, a company so it was mixed um, um uh, british artists like Chicken Shack and um, Fleetwood Mac, mixed with American artists who were living and recording in Europe, like Eddie Boyd and Champion Jack Dupree and, and stuff. And the other one, uh, the other album in the package was all Columbia recordings. Uh, Johnny Winter, uh, Janis Joplin, Mike okay. Bloomfield were on there, but also Sunhouse, Robert Johnson, Blind Lemon Jefferson, Ma Rainey, names I had never heard before. Yeah. And when I started listening to that record at home, uh, and looking at the cover, it said Blind Lemon Jefferson Prison Cell Blues, recorded in 1928. I had no idea anybody made records in 1928. You know, <laughs> at 13, you don't think think that far back in a way. You know, yeah, yeah. and and when I listened to Terraplane Blues, uh, it just something. I, it was like coming from outer space or whatever. It was something I had never heard before. You know, and then Columbia put out the Sun House album. Uh, him. Uh, was a was a fairly old man, you know, and with a pretty intense face, and having a, a metal resonator guitar in front of him. I said, I th thought, what is this? What is this all about? You know, I've never seen a guitar like that before. And so it it developed from from those actually from those two albums, you know, okay. and and Columbia put out Sunhouse record and different other records, blues records, and. So, uh, and I have to say, I was very privileged. I had very open-minded, very liberal, and very supporting parents. So, uh, for that Christmas, actually, I got the, I think, the Sun House album as a Christmas present, you know. <laughs> and how old you? Um, I was 13. <laughs> yes. So, Sun it started from there, you know. In Germany, he's 13 years old, and he gets for his Christmas present. A recording by Sunhouse, a guy who recorded in 1920. Yeah, and, and it, it's a recording Sunhouse made after he was rediscovered in 1965. It was that fabulous photo uh, on the yes. cover? You know, and you didn't play music. No, I didn't play music at all. <laughs> in, in school, we were forced to play the recorder, which was total torture for me. You know, <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> you know, and then how did you become this well-known, great photographer that you are? Oh, that happened later. You know, I was never ambitious about anything in in life, really. You know, but it, you had a vision, though. You had this. You had this eye. No, I just you... did things that that I enjoyed doing it, and and uh, that I thought were fun for me. You know, so I started. Uh, you know, as so many. I mean, I could ramble on and on. Um, but uh, 
photography, there was a sideline um, that happened a little bit later on, you know. Um, there was one record uh, I, I bought in 1971 uh, um, of the Alan Lomax field trip, 1959, uh, the, the Folk Heritage series on Atlantic. And it had a color photo of Fred McDowell in, uh, uh, on there uh, with the overalls and the guitar and the field behind him. Beautiful light. It's an incredible photograph. Yes. And it turned out on the on the back of the album set a photo by Lee Friedlander, who I later discovered was one of the icons of American photography. Actually, he's still alive, almost 90 years old. Un unbelievable uh, uh, photo uh, photographer. But anyway, um, so um, the, the photography started more seriously uh, the first time I went to the States in 1972, I had a little point-and-shoot uh, camera, nothing nothing fancy, you know. And and uh, the photography started a little bit later, like in 1974. There, uh, a teacher from, from a high school was giving uh, photo classes in the afternoon as a workshop program or whatever, so I enjoyed I, I joined that to, to learn a little bit about photography and stuff like that. So it started from there, uh, actually, uh, right along with the blues, you know, and once... Like I said, uh, uh, I was very privileged. My parents, middle, solid middle class family, they were fairly well off. So uh, uh, in 1975, I got a decent uh, 35 millimeter reflex camera as a uh, Christmas present. And of course, I combined nice those. Nice parents, really nice parents. Yes. I, I, com <laughs> I combined those two things, you know. Once I started going to blues concerts, I took my camera along. And of course, I had all. Uh, s copies of the old blues magazines like uh, Blues Unlimited and stuff and, and you would, you know, look at the photographs and especially Valerie Wilmer, the great photographer Bell, from yes. from uh, London, um, she was one of the few uh, that I was really impressed with. And then there was another one from the United States. Um, uh, I got his book, um, Blow My Blues Away in 1972, um, uh, George Mitchell. And he had a combination of photography writing and sound recording and i was very impressed with his photographs at that time because he went to mississippi and different places and took very intense photos of the people the musicians and their living conditions their families and the whole scenery yeah. so you know and once i got deeper into photography i started you know being interested in in the 1930s photography walker evans uh, ben sean russell lee and discovering, you know, like I said, the work of Lee Friedlander and the different other photographers, uh, documentary uh, photographers that I enjoyed. And that was a big inspiration for me at that time, you know. Did you know that when you were taking photos that you were photographing a historical moment? No, you never think about those things because it was so natural. You know, all these great musicians, uh, I live in a small town in Germany, but it was surrounded by fairly bigger cities, uh, Braunschweig, Hanover, Göttingen, and Hildesheim, they all had jazz clubs. So within one hour, I could see, you know, Dr. Ross, one of the greatest blues shows I ever saw. You could see Big Joe Williams and uh, Louisiana Red, Sonny Land Slim, I mean, Blind John Davis, they all toured Germany all the time, you know. So I would just go there. I even had a, at that point had a portable tape machine, uh, you were five inch reel and a Two, two good microphones, and I was recording whenever the manager or the artist would allow me to record, I would record the shows and take pictures at the same time. So it was fun for me, you know. It, but you did a lot, you made a lot of recordings of artists. I did, well. yes, yes, yes. And one that I just love is your Watergate Blues with Big Joe Williams. Every time I hear it, in fact, I still have it. I'll, I'll get my copy out. Get, it's right it on here. That's actually, it. actually, this is a CD version. This is the original album when it first came out. That's the original album there. Yeah, yeah. Big it's, Joe Williams, Back yeah. to the Roots. Yeah, and then and uh, um, see, this was put out. Uh, recorded. It says here, recorded in Crawford, Mississippi. I want the people to see this. <laughs> yeah, and, and we, you know, it's it's a photo out cover. We did a we did get a pretty 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 good job with this album. Wow. You know? And um, oh, okay. Um, is it, the, is it is it in English? Did you publish it, it in German? No, no, no. The 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 the, the lot of notes I wrote in English. Okay. This came out in 1980, uh, and the and the Watergate Blues is on here. And uh, actually, for the presentation last night, it was exactly to the day yesterday, Wednesday, August the second, 1978, that I made that Watergate recording in Mashulaville, Mississippi, 
uh, Big Joe playing a mean electric six string guitar. He was famous for his um, nine string guitar. But what happened, uh, we heard about a musician lived way out in the sticks in Mashulaville, Mississippi called Luke Harris. And we went there together to check him out. And he had an amp and a six string electric guitar. And there were some neighbors hanging out. And so Big Joe, of course, grabbed the guitar and uh, started playing and I recorded it. And you can hear the people yelling in the background. It was, it was, it was a powerful performance. How about we start with some recordings and we start by playing Big Joe Williams' Watergate Blues. <laughs> Well, I went out to service station this morning. Yes. Trying to get my gas ticket straight. Mm -hmm. So you can't get but three gallon of gas, big Joe. You know this is a water gate, and every time I look at my TV, <laughs> I can't see a thing. Help with water gate. <laughs> Everything straight. <laughs> well, the rooster told the hen, I want you to go lay. Say, no, in my home, I can't got nothing but water gate every time I look at my TV. I want everybody to leave President Nixon alone. Let him leave long with California and go back to his mansion home. Every time I get my TV, get a thing but water game. I'll be so glad with President Carter. Get a dog on Thanks That was Watergate Blues with Big Joe Williams. That was recorded on August 2nd. And here we are a day afterwards on the 3rd. And that was a Wednesday, August the 2nd. Yeah, like I said, exactly to the day 45 years ago. 45 years ago. Yeah, I was 22. And then you mentioned something about how uh, for you as a German to surmising uh, you as a German you had to have an understanding of English and you right. mentioned something about Joe's Joe's education uh, about how he was was he functionally illiterate or could he could no he, he was read? totally illiterate he, he, nothing he could he could not even write Joe okay whenever he would sign a record I have a picture we can show uh, of him signing an album he made all these funny little things uh, whatever came of crosses or whatever uh, yeah. he could think of, you know. I remember one album he signed, it was so cute. It, it was an album that Chris Trackwitz put out with all the old recordings of Joe and Sonny Boy Williamson. So on the cover, it was a picture of Joe as a young man and Sonny Boy Williamson before he was murdered in 1948. So Joe signed the album for his picture, and then he said, oh, I need to do one for, for my old friend Sonny Boy, and he did a whatever. <laughs> Lines he would draw for Sonny Boy as well. It was really cute, I thought, you know. Yeah, yeah. And Chris Strakowicz started the Arhuli. Yeah, record. and he had a, he had a, Arhuli was all new recordings and uh, blues classics was reissues from old 78s, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just wanted to do that. And, but I wanted to also just say how, on the back here, when you talk about the strange guitar, you'll see this when we show a, co a close up of the photo. He played a nine string guitar. Right. He, he added three strings right. at the top here. <laughs> yeah, Big Joe was a very complex character, and he was a total individual, you know? I mean, other people might have just took a 12-string and took three strings off, but he took a six-string and added three strings, you know? <laughs> and, and I mean, all his guitars, uh, uh, they look pretty funky, you know? There are other guitars, or pictures of other guitars that he used before that one, and uh, they all, you know, had taped them up and whatever, you know? I mean, they were pretty in pretty bad shape but he had a sound that nobody else had no. and there's no way anybody could ever imitate big joe no. williams no. he was a total original musician yes it was just the more i listen to him uh uh um the more i'm, I'm getting aware of of 
what he represents. He was a true blues giant, absolutely, yeah. to me. And I always say for blues musicians that I knew, uh, I, these days I always say Big Joe set the standard for me, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and um, yeah, and, and in, a, in a way he's totally forgotten uh, today, uh, which is a shame, you know. The main focus is on yeah. guys like maybe because of the Robert Johnson connection, Sun yeah. House, then Charlie Patton of the founder, so-called founder of the Delta Blues and Skip James of the very intense recordings he made. Yeah. But, well, of course, Patton died in 1934, but guys like Booker White and uh, Sun, uh, Sun House and Skip James, they made some great records as late as 1941, uh, Skip James, 1930, uh, 31, um, um, Sun House, 1930, and 41 and 42 for, for Alan Lomax. But then they disappeared and they were inactive for about 30 years until record collectors relocated them in Mississippi or Sun House in Rochester, New York, okay. but not so big Joe Williams. He was constantly recording. He started making his first records in 1935 then all through the 40s he recorded, uh, even into the 50s, early 50s, trumpet records in Jackson, Mississippi. Some of the best stuff he ever recorded. Unbelievable, unbelievably powerful. Then he was up in Chicago in 1956, recording with a harmonica player and a drummer for VJ Records. Uh, oh, that's right. And, yeah, and at the that. same time, yeah. uh, he was introducing himself to some of the collector's labels, you know, like yeah. Bob Custer, in in the mid 50s in St. Louis operating Delmark Records Delmar, and Big Delmar. Joe had heard about Delmark Records so he introduced himself to Bob Custer took an old <laughs> promo photo from Bluebird Records with him to prove that he was a real Big Joe Williams you know and then, then I mean he was amazing he always you know when other guys from that generation well practically all of them had well the ones a lot of them had died, you know, but yeah. they were not active anymore. Yeah. You know, Big Joe Williams was all, all uh, right up to the end of his life in 1980. He was an active musician. That's all he did for 50 or 60 years, traveling all over the United States yeah. and making recordings, Amazing. you know. And uh, it was unbelievable, all the musicians he encountered, you know. I mean, yeah. he could he could talk for hours and hours of all kinds of musicians from from Jay Bird Coleman in Alabama to Bob Dylan you know yeah. <laughs> even when he was in England he said oh well the last time I, I saw Paul from the Beatles he had that Chinese girl with him was <laughs> <laughs> his, his, his wife oh it's a girl. you know it's a, I mean it, it's amazing when yeah you the big Joe was it, unbelievable uh, it, we, we cannot even come close but, to what he experienced in his life you but know? let's also reflect on his music when we think about the song that he had the most success with and he's most known for was baby please don't right, go right, right. baby please don't go back down in new orleans yeah. i love but you but let so. me ask this, let me ask you, this. you lived with him yeah how would wait, wait a minute what is, you're from germany right what what are you doing in mississippi <laughs> living in joe's house how did it happen well, he didn't have a house he left uh he had a, a caravan trailer when i first met him it's a, it was a pretty Pretty funky place. Uh, we can show the picture, and uh, it's on the USB stick. Okay. We'll but anyway, you know what happened? Um, um, like I was telling you, um, uh, uh, when I uh, uh, got into the blues around 1970, um, the first blues show I actually uh, saw was the American Folk Blues Festival in 1972, and Big Joe Williams was part of the program. So uh, I went up to Bremen, uh, some friends from there had called me that the show was happening there. And my father had a portable small Ewer tape machine and I took that to the concert hall. I was sitting in row five, holding up the microphone, taping the show <laughs> from the audience. And then we went backstage to have the poster signed. And uh, Robert Pete Williams was uh, on the same program, T-Bone Walker, Memphis Slim and Big Mama Thornton. And so Robert Pete Williams, I think he was a little little drunk uh, at that point. Uh, he saw the tape machine and the microphone and said, switch it on. And he grabbed the microphone and sang an a cappella version of uh, Two White Horses, One Kind Favor. See that, my grave is kept clean. And then Big Joe was sitting back there and said, hey, 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 hand me the microphone, give the microphone to me. And one, two, three, testing, one, two, three, testing. And he started singing uh, one, one Kind Favor, uh, uh, Two White Horses. Yeah. Um, uh, back in the, the dressing room in, in uh, on um, uh, March the 15th, 1972. And Big Joe was my hero, my blues hero at that time. Yeah. And I'm there 
almost I turned I turned uh, 16 uh, like three weeks later almost 16 and this guy is sitting there I know he made records in 1935 played with Sonny Boy and all these great other artists and he's just singing for me <laughs> I was totally blown away it was unbelievable you know yeah, yeah. and uh, so that was the first recording I ever made of a blues artist and of uh, of course it was big Joe Williamson uh, uh, that night in the in the in the dressing room, so we can listen to that as well. It's it's only one and a half minutes. Yes, yeah, so we'll listen to this. This is Big Joe live, and Axel's first recording when he was just a teenager. Right. One two three testing. One two three testing. Yeah. If you have a hug, shake your tongue. If you have a hug. Shake me a tongue. Have you ever heard? Who church me a tongue? Know that the poor are dead and gone. We had two white horses and a line. We had two white horses and a line. Two white horses. In the night, wanna take me down to the bearing ground. My heart stopped beating, my hand got cold. My heart stopped beating, my hand got cold. My heart stopped beating, Lord, my hand got cold. And you know that the poor part didn't go. If you ever heard church bell tone, ever heard church bell tone, ever heard church bell tone, you know that the poor part didn't go. Well, what happened? Uh um, so, so you were, that was the first blues show I ever saw. So uh, uh, there were other shows uh, during the next year and and uh, during the end of 1972. But um, there was a booking agency uh, in Koblenz, Germany, Siggy Music, operated by a, a fellow called Siggy Christman, Siegfried Christman, and he was booking blues artists on solo tours. You know, the other one where I met Big Joe the first time was the package tour. You know, okay, and. But he booked Big Joe in March 1973 on a tour of three, three weeks, three one-nighters in Germany and, and uh, Holland and uh, Switzerland and different, Austria and different places, you know. So uh, uh, Big Joe played two shows uh, uh, right there where I lived. So I saw those two shows. And uh, at the end of the tour, uh, he, was, he played two shows in Berlin, March the 30th and the 31st. And there was a blues researcher, blues fan photographer called Norbert Hess in Berlin. And he, he, he bo would book the artist in a huge concert hall, an old uh, movie theater. Uh, there was a concert hall. And um, so he was taking care of the artist, picking them up at the airport and, and bringing them to the hotel and stuff like that. So uh, uh, I went to Berlin for the weekend when Big Joe was there because it gave me a chance to, to get to know him quite well, to be around him all the time. And so I recorded... I recorded the first concert, um, the whole concert uh, that night, uh, Friday, uh, March the th uh, 30th. And then the next day, uh, and I asked Big Joe after the show, well, what are you doing tomorrow? You know, basically he was in his hotel room all by himself, you know, nothing to do. So I said, is there any way I can uh, come to the hotel tomorrow afternoon and, and just hang out with you a little bit? And so I took the tape recorder along. I had some tapes of some shows he had played in Germany and, and different uh, places, uh, older recordings. And we listened to some of those. And uh, I remember when I, when I went, knocked on his door and um, uh, um, I think the door of the room was open. He was just laying in the bed and, and hollering the blues to himself when I got there. <laughs> and, you know, I had my microphone stand and the, the Sennheiser microphone with me and the portable Ewer tape machine. And so... You know, he played in the hotel room for me for a whole hour on his uh, nine-string guitar, and he, uh, on that tour he also had a twelve-string guitar along. So that was a first full session of Big Joe playing just for me in the hotel room in Berlin on March the thirty-first, 
1973. And we can listen to one of the tracks that we later put on this album. The first track uh, down down in the bottom, um, down in the bottom, um, uh, recorded that afternoon in in Berlin 50 years ago. <laughs> I was 16. <laughs> okay, we'll listen to that. Then. Yeah. Run your baby, sit down on my knee. Run your baby, sit down on my knee. You know I like putting my mouth what you would, the devil out of me. Down the bottom, bring my boots and shoes. Way down at the bottom, bring my boots and shoes. Baby, going up me and I ain't no time to lose. touring in Germany all the time and Louisiana Red, Duke Boy Bonner who I got to know quite well and uh, different other ones so um, and uh, well of course uh, that was Big Joe but but uh, 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 you know I'm, in, I'm, in 19... I'm, I'm, I'm blown away man. I'm completely blown away <laughs> I'm completely blown away in, in 1972 uh, I had a chance to spend my summer vacation with friends of our family in, in California so that was my first time going to the United States. And um, I had a few addresses. Somebody in Germany, uh, uh, a German uh, blues researcher, supplied the address of David Evans. And uh, uh, the family lived in a small town in, uh, um, east of, in Orange County, east of uh, Los Angeles, called Yorba Linda. And it happened to turn out that David Evans lived in the same, same town. So I knew David Evans from the field recordings he had made, the albums. So uh, I got to meet David Evans on that trip uh, 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 in July 1972. Also uh, was able to meet Chris Strachwitz in San Francisco. He didn't even have his own down-home music store at that point. Okay. Uh, he was still packing up the mail order boxes in the basement of a record store called Jack's Record Cellar in San Francisco. So I got to meet him there. But what, what happened before I went to California, uh, I got a hold of an old issue of, I think it was Blues Unlimited, and they had a listing of addresses of blues players in there from the United States. And I picked out the ones who lived in California. It was Casey Douglas, 
uh, I had an album by him already. It was uh, Elsie Goodrock and Robinson and George Harmonica Smith, the harmonica player, played with Muddy Waters. And so I wrote to all three of them. I'm a 16-year-old German blues fan. Um, is there any way uh, 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 I can meet up with you while I'm in California? And they all wrote back. <laughs> <laughs> and I was totally blown away by the letter that Casey Douglas sent me. You know, you are, uh, here I am, a 16-year-old German blues fan, getting a letter to my small town where I live in Germany by Casey Douglas inviting me. <laughs> you know, and we can show the letter. It's on the USB stick, so we can show the letter. It was unbelievable. And um, I got to meet him. Uh, I called him up when I was in, in the Bay Area in San Francisco. He lived in Berkeley. I'll never forget the, the street address, 808 Alston Way. So I went there with a tape machine. He sat in his kitchen and played blues for me for an hour and talked about his life, you know. And uh, I had read the uh, Tommy Johnson book that David Evans had um uh, writ, uh, uh, written about the life of the legendary Tommy That's from Johnson. That's the Paul Oliver series. Yeah, the Studio the Vista paper, the paperbacks. Studio, the yeah, paperbacks. I bought yeah. those when I was in England in 1971. Um, and uh, so I was familiar with Tommy Johnson. I had his old recordings on a reissue album. And I was sitting in Casey Douglas' kitchen, just like we sit here now. He plays guitar and starts talking about Tommy Johnson, you know. I mean, it was, <laughs> you know, how he met him and, and uh, you know, how Tommy Johnson would get drunk and Casey Douglas would say, see, I don't never get drunk. That's too low for me and stuff. It was, it was just unbelievable, you know. He was so friendly and so welcoming. Uh, yeah, yeah. And um, so uh, uh, we can actually um, uh, play, uh, play one song, Hear Me Howling, by Casey Douglas that I made that day. It was August the 15th, 1972, Casey Douglas in his kitchen. That was the first blues recording I ever made in the United States. Let me 
ask you this. When you went to Casey's house, yeah. was that an all black neighborhood? I can't was it actually mixed race? I can't remember actually. I'm not sure. Because I'm 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 curious. This is the seventies. Nineteen seventy two, yeah, you're, yeah. You're a, a white German guy right. going into a black neighborhood. I would have imagined that he would have lived in a black neighborhood. Did you feel it? With, I'm just curious as to the, the no, social I, context. I, from what I remember, it was not far from the university campus. Because so I, I was staying there. with a friend yeah. that I had met. He was an exchange student in Göttingen, and he didn't want to go along. Uh, 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 so he stayed. Uh, he lay down in, on the in the okay. uh, on the campus uh, to relax while I was uh, visiting Casey Douglas. I think it was actually walking distance from the campus. Really? I can't remember right off. So was he well off? Was he well off? He worked for the city city of Berkeley, and he so was a, he was a, he had a good solid. Yeah. Uh, secure existence, yeah. you know, yeah. and he was playing music on weekends, and uh, he okay. had made some records and was recording. Uh, uh, I think uh, at that time uh, he was recording for our Huli Records, you know. So he was quite well known in the Bay Area, That's playing festivals, That's but That's also still playing uh, black neighborhoods and yeah. black uh, black clubs and stuff like that. It's good to know. know he wasn't. He was. A, he was originally from Mississippi, and what what he did. Uh, you know, played the traditional Mississippi style, but he was writing his own songs. He made a record in 1947 that was actually covered by different rock musicians and country musicians, Mercury Mercury Blues. Mercury, that's right. Yeah, I'm Crazy, crazy about, about Mercury. Mercury. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Crazy uh, about that was Mercury. Casey Douglas. Yeah, that's right. Uh, 1947. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Uh, was uh, playing guitar with Sidney Maiden on harmonica. Yeah. And, um, and I think Steve Miller and, and David Lindley, they recorded it. And in the 80s, it was a big uh, hit for a country singer, uh, Alan Jackson. Okay. He made a recording. Uh, uh, so he uh, made some money then. <laughs> if, no, if he sadly, retained no the sadly, he passed away in 1975. He was. He told me uh, that he was planning on retiring shortly after I met him, and then he would wanted to be a full time musician. And they were actually already talking of him coming to Europe, but sadly that never did happen. Oh, he okay. passed away in, uh, just three years later. I was looking at that. We, the reason why I asked that question because I was always. I'm curious about the social context for it because you had to stand out like a sore thumb, even if you were looking like a hippie with your long hair and your yeah, yeah. your flowery clothes. Yeah, and this yeah, and that. yeah, yeah. I mean, even black people would have seen you as strange, especially if you look at it from the kind of Christian background that was like predominant yeah, but, at the time. But I remember there was an, a see at that time when I was in California. Uh, um, I, I couldn't drive my own car. I was too young and there was no yeah. way. So um, um, our friend, we had, uh, she had been an exchange student in Germany. That's how we met her. She drove me around f for whenever she had time, you know. And I remember there was a, another blues player that I had not written to, but, but got his phone number somehow, J.D. Nicholson. He was a piano player. Yeah. And, uh, and I called him up and wanted to meet him. I didn't know anything about him. I didn't had never heard any of his records or anything like that. And I remember Molly, um, um, our um, California, uh, my California friend, she drove me. That was a black neighborhood. I remember yeah. because it looked, on you know, from from what I experienced on later trips, it was the same type of shotgun shacks like you would find in Louisiana and Mississippi. It was an all black neighborhood. Uh, uh, but when we stopped by uh, at his place, he wasn't at home. So we, we um, uh, I didn't have a chance to meet him. But I remember one incident that was really funny. And I, at that time, I was very strictly into blues, just blues, yeah. black blues, nothing else. Yeah. And there was a younger black guy sitting between the houses and eating watermelon. And so I started a little conversation with him. And he, he said, now what you, what you looking for, you know, uh, what for kind of music? And I said, uh, uh, and he said, uh, 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 rock and roll or blues? And I said, of course, blues. And he said, oh, come on, man. It's all the same, man. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember that very vividly, you know. And he was right, you know. <laughs> this is what I find really, really, I mean, I, I know that you're not on camera today, but I find it really amazing that a lot of Brits, Europeans, German in your case, you would go to the black neighborhoods with no fear. No, Did you have man, any concern for yourself? Mad dogs and Englishmen. Mad dogs and Englishmen. Well put. Well put. Yeah, and maybe maybe it actually did help that I was from Germany, and of course it would always help that I would take the effort coming from Germany and being interested in the mu in the music, you know. So I guess that yeah. that, that was a big advantage, you know.
Yeah. Uh, 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 and like we talked about this morning, maybe maybe a lot of the musicians had the feeling they were very well uh, received in in Europe. You yeah. know, somebody said they treated us like celebrity or like like kings coming over. You know, and and maybe there was a feeling that all the terrible things that happened to African Americans. And I still think America is basically a segregated society even today. You know okay. that 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 I I, w I would come from a different background with not being prejudiced and not with a history of abuse and cruelty and racism and all these terrible things uh, uh, that happened. That that they accepted me more because of that because of my pure uh, uh, an intention of interest in their music and their art. You know, and them as persons, as, as yeah, people. yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, there's the another humanities. story that's. T I, I told a story uh, yesterday, totally amazing to me. Uh, in 1978, when I was getting ready to go to the states for six months, I was working at the post office for six months to get get the money and uh, um, uh, to be able to travel for six months over there. There was a booking agency in Cologne, uh, Rolf Schubert, and he brought over um, a bunch of American blues musicians. And he had a tour in January 1978 of a, a blues player, guitar player from Chicago, Joe Carter, who was not a full-time musician. Um, uh, he still had a, had a job, I think, in a meat packing factory or something like that. But uh, he took his vacation, came over and um, uh, played Elmo James type of slide guitar, you know, straight okay. out of the 50s. He was incredible, a real good looking, handsome man yeah, yeah. with a ruffled shirt, you know, and a, and a big bow tie and a, this old, beautiful old 50s style Epiphone guitar playing like Elmo James, you know, it was visually exciting. So I took his photograph. Uh, it was his first time ever in, in Europe. Uh, he was backed by two German musicians, bass and uh, uh, drums. So I taped the show that night and uh, uh, took the photographs. And then I had a conversation with him. Look, Mr. Carter, um, um, I'm planning on coming to the States in a couple of months, and I would love to come to Chicago as well. You know, he said, yeah, yeah, you, if you come to Chicago, you can stay with me. You know, he gave me his address, phone number and everything. So at the beginning of my six months trip, I was in New Orleans and um, um, Jackson, Mississippi. And then I took a Greyhound bus out of the blue Greyhound bus from from um, Jackson, Mississippi, 18 hours ride up to Chicago. From the bus station, I called up Joe Carter. He lived on this in the south side, south side of Chicago, where usually white people don't go. Yeah, I yeah. took a cab out there. I wound up staying with him for five weeks there. <laughs> Sunnyland Slim lived right across the street, you know. So, so while Joe Carter was working, I spent a lot of time with Sunnyland Slim and Big Time Sarah at that time. <laughs> you can't make this up. No, no. It, it, and he was well received. He yeah, was... yeah. I had no, no problem whatsoever. <laughs> Everybody was really friendly. Yeah, yeah. And, you know. I just find this absolutely amazing. Yeah, I mean, to me, really it, it still is. You know, I yeah. mean, just meeting a total stranger. I had never met Joe Carter before. He had never met me before. Yeah. Being friendly enough, if you come to Chicago, you can stay with you me. Can stay with me. Yeah, yeah, and I just went there and wound up staying with him for five weeks. <laughs> it was, it was unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, it still is. Looking back, I know, I know. That's what I, I mean, those were incredible. I can tell you so many more stories about stuff like that that happened to me on those trips. It, it was just, it still is. Looking back, absolutely amazing. I always say, even the people that I had not met before. Uh, and wound up staying with them, like Hemi Nixon in Brownsville. I just, you know, Sleepy John Estes had died in yeah. 77, but I knew Hemi Nixon, his harmonica player, uh, was still still alive in Brownsville, Tennessee. I just drove up there and asked around until I found him, knock on his door, introduced myself, wound up staying with him for two or three nights. <laughs> As a total stranger, you know. And, and, uh, and I always say these days, I always came as a stranger and always left as a friend. Came as a stranger and left as a friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was absolutely amazing to me. I mean, Big Joe I knew quite well, so when I went there, he knew me. But I was totally accepted by his family, neighbors, all of them, you know, uh, 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 accepted me uh, without any, any. there was no, no problems at all, you know. Well, I have a personal connection that I want to just attach to this conversation. You also went to Washington, D.C., my sure hometown. Did. And you interviewed some people before I met them that were very influ very extremely influential to me. 
Right. And so let's talk about that. You went to Washington. What year was that? The same year, but I can tell you exactly how that came about. Okay. Uh, that's a, one of the, uh, uh, I mean, even in, on later trips, there were so many strange incidents, like something was leading me, a superior force was leading me to the right people in the right places, you know. Some amazing... I, I uh, think this too is it's weird. Some I'm, amazing things yes. happened to me later on. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, can t yeah. I mean, I could ramble on about all yes. this. Anyway, <laughs> um, um, before the trip to the United States, um, I went to Hamburg, Germany. Uh, uh, there was a blues band performing called, uh, called themselves the Mississippi Delta Blues Band. Uh, and it had um, two veteran musicians on that particular tour. One was Yank Rachel, the mandolin player, who was actually not from Mississippi, he was from Tennessee, and a harmonica player called Tennessee Lee Crisp, um, uh, who was uh, also uh, from Tennessee, and played with Sleepy John Estes, and some younger black musicians as a backup band, you know, guys I had never heard of, younger guys playing drums, bass, and rhythm guitar. And those shows were promoted by an African-American promoter called Tom Boyd. He lived in Palo Alto, California. And um, these were, the, the group was always called Mississippi Delta Blues Band, but they were more or less like a generic blues band put together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he even managed in the, before that, even in the mid seventies, he managed to bring a group like that to Romania, you know, behind the Iron Curtain, it was absolutely amazing. But anyway, so I went there, uh, it was February the 14th, 1978, to see that show and take photographs. And Tom Boyd had some albums of those different, um, 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 the Delta, uh, 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 Mississippi Delta Blues Bands. And one album had a collage of different photo of, of musicians, the front and the back, but it didn't indicate who those musicians were. And um, I didn't buy the album that night, but I have a fit, pretty good photographic memory for things, you know. So on the back of the album, there was a photo of a black lady playing a huge resonator guitar with a slide and a younger black guy with a big afro, obviously playing harmonica behind her. When I saw this photo, I said, who can this lady be? I'm going to the States. Who is she? You know, it's, this looks really interesting. And I don't think I asked him, Tom Boyd, who was with the group uh, uh, that night. Obviously, the photo was taken at a festival, some kind of folk festival. But I had no idea who she was, no clue where and whatever, you know. And so almost exactly two months later, I w went down to New Orleans right at the beginning of my 1978 trip. Uh, took a Greyhound bus from New Jersey down to New Orleans, 32 hour ride to see the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival. It was not anywhere as big as it is today. They had all these little stages set up in the on the fairgrounds and the racetrack, and um, and uh, so I, that the first day I went there, I think it was April the eighth, nineteen seventy eight. There was a stage, and that same lady I saw in the picture two months before was playing there. I recognized the the, the huge resonator guitar. Yeah, yeah. I was totally amazed, you know, that yeah, she yeah. would be there. And after after she had played, uh, you know, uh, I started talking to her, and she had two um, young black musicians with her. One played harmonica, Larry Wise, and the other one was Tim Lewis played guitar. Did you get to know Tim? Uh, only Larry. I only knew Larry. Not oh, Tim. okay. Yeah. Anyway, so we started talking, and what happened? They were, it turned out they were from Washington D.C., but were not booked at the festival. What they did, they just drove down on an off chance that the promoters might put them on the show, and the promoters did. Okay. Put them, they introduced themselves, and they, they were part of the festival right away. So that's how I got to meet Flora and Larry and Tim, and they told me, uh, I had no, uh, not planned to, to uh, Washington DC was not a place I was intending on visiting, because I didn't think there was any interesting blues going on there. It's not on, on my travel plan, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they they told me, come up to Washington DC. We got some more good musicians up here, you know? And so uh, I was pretty open to where I wanted to go on the trip. But but so uh, uh, I drove down, I bought a car in New Jersey uh, uh, in, in June, 1978. So I drove from New Jersey, I drove down to Washington DC and, uh, and I stayed with Tim Lewis. And um, of course, uh, saw Flora again, and then Tim introduced me to John Cephas and Archie Edwards. John was 
was uh, still working in the as a carpenter in the basement of the National Guard Armory. Yes. Uh, I went there with Tim, and and you know we were a very relaxed evening. I had my portable tape machine, of course the uh, the um, uh, the camera along, and uh, we sat there for a couple of hours. And Tim Tim played some guitar, so they jammed a little bit. It was very relaxed, you know. Uh, John was still in his work clothes, and uh, I taped it. And we can listen to one of the recordings I made that on that first meeting of John Cephas. <laughs> and, uh... I was standing down in Britain on a corner of Broadway, Maine. I walked to police and saw what is your right name. Then I told him my name. I'm a woman full of lover and I sure don't have to worry I'm gonna die, me a bulldog I'm a shuffle to the hound I'm gonna use these dogs just to run my good gal down I'm gonna use these dogs just to watch me while I sleep Just to keep them in from making that early Talking ain't right. Now if you wanna dog me, I'm gonna run both day and night. Two days later, um, Tim introduced me uh, to Archie Edwards. We went to Archie's barbershop, and I did the same thing. Set up my tape machine, took some photos, and Archie talked about his life and uh, played some of his music, which was beautiful. He played a great resonator guitar. Archie was really good, you know. So, and I guess those first meetings uh, changed their lives later on a little bit, you know, I would say, you know. Well, it, it changed and affected mine as well because they were my first guitar teachers. I knew nothing about blues at all. Everything I learned came from them. Right, right. And now look at me. Yeah, I'm over yeah, 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 yeah. It's so amazing. it was your fault. Yeah, yeah. It's your <laughs> fault. It's, I just realized this. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's amazing the way uh, uh, those things yeah. happened uh, 45 years ago. So Archie was probably, looking back, he was the greatest unknown musician that I uh, uh, had the uh, pleasure of meeting. Uh, uh, he was, Archie was really good. Yes. He was outstanding, he was very special. He was playing the traditional stuff, but at the same time he was always creating uh, 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 interesting songs that he was writing within that traditional musical framework, you know, so he was really good. 
Yeah. Archie was very, very special. Yeah, I knew Archie. He was well. a great slide player too, you know. Yeah, I, I remember that because he was friends with Mississippi John Hurt. Exactly. When yeah. John Hurt came to Washington for the Library of Congress recordings, he became friends. In fact, he used to cut John Hurt's hair. Right, in, in the, the barbershop. Barber yeah. And I remember it's it's uh, on the uh, tape, on the conversation I had with, with Archie that night. And uh, he said um, um, uh, um, John Hurt had made records in the 1920s, late 1920s. So he told Archie, look, brother Archie, uh, my stuff in Blind Lemon, it's all been played. I'll write you some songs on your own. Do some, some of your own stuff. And he was right. So Archie could do both. He could play the old traditional stuff like John Henry or whatever, Candyman, whatever, and, and write his own s songs uh, within that same musical uh, framework uh, in, in a way, you know. Yeah, so let's play. Let's play one of the recordings you did. I like the one that you did. The road is rough and rocky. Yeah, that's Archie talking about his friendship with uh, Mississippi John Hurt. Uh, uh, that's a beautiful song, you know. Oh, it's a great song. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So how about if we 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 conclude uh, with the road is rough and rocky because that's what it's like on this blues road. The two of us work together, so I I kind of mixed our music up. This is some of his stuff. He went back to Mississippi and passed away. Yes, for you know, looking back, uh, it's 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 unbelievable in a way. I mean, I've been to to the states looking for the blues basically on thirty trips. You know, so I spent quite a lot of time in the states and met a lot of uh, interesting musicians, interesting people. Uh, it was not always easy. I, I can I have to admit that coming from a well-to-do middle-class background. 
I was confronted, uh, even staying with Big Joe in Crawford, Mississippi, uh, it was almost a lot of times uh, like a third world situation within the United States. And in, in even in later trips in, in the 1990s, I was confronted with horrible poverty. It was heartbreaking, yeah. you know. Actually, uh, a funny thing happened to me years ago. Uh, I was showing a exhibition of my photographs, of my blues photos in Germany. And usually uh, 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 at the bottom of each photo, you would, uh, I would name the artist in the place where the photo was taken, you know, like yeah. Joe Cole, Bobo, Mississippi, uh, May 2000, you know, so yeah. anybody looking at the photo would know about where they came from. But a lady walked up to me and she asked me, where did you take, uh, did you take these photos in Cuba? And I told her, no, it's the United States, supposedly the richest country in the world. Wow. I thought it was really interesting, you know. Wow, I know, I know. And that's why I love having this conversation with you. And that's what I liked about Paul Oliver when we first met, because he was interested more in the social context. You automatically, I mean, if you see Big Joe in a in a concert hall in Germany, he's removed from his hometown, his home territory. It's fine to see him, but you can only experience where the music really belongs when you stay with him and even how his relatives and other people would react to different situations, you know. I remember a situation in nineteen in two thousand. I was in Alabama and that's a long story, but I I had done research on the great Alabama slide guitar player Dan Pickett. Okay. And I found his brother Grover in Alabama and um and his sister too. And there was another blues player uh in in Ariton, Alabama, um called J. W. Warren. So I took yes. J. W. one time to Dan Pickett's uh, sister and um, uh, Dan Pickett's brother Grover was there. And J.W. Warren started playing the old stuff, just basically Blind Boy Fuller style, you know, yeah, yeah. similar to what Dan Pickett would have done. And Grover Pickett started crying. He had to leave the room because it. he went out outdoors with tears in his eyes. And later he said it reminded him so much of the old days and yeah. of his brother that it, it affected him in such an intense way that he started crying, you know. I mean, something like that would never happen in a concert situation in yeah, Germany. Yeah, yeah. But it, those were intense, really intense moments where you, where you have a feel, where I had the feeling that the music has much, a mo much more intense meaning to the people down there than it would ever have, have to uh, 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 German or European audiences, you know, yeah, yeah. who have no clue how the scenery uh, actually looks like down there, you know. Axel, I can't say thank you enough. As well, when Paul signed my edition of The Conversation with the Blues, he signed it. Michael, the conversation continues. Thank you. Thanks a whole lot. I enjoy this. <laughs> and once you get me started, man, I could ramble on for hours and hours. And actually, Conversation with the Blues is one of the first blues books I read. I was very impressed. In 1971, there was an American library in Hanover, Germany. And they had a few uh, uh, British and American blues books. So the original version was one of the first blues books I ever read. And I was very impressed with, with the book at that time because of the combination of photography and the interviews, you know, the stories. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. All right. I enjoyed being here. It was, it's always fun for me. <laughs> it's, it's so much part of my life, you know, an indelible part of my own history, you yes. know. Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you.